This month of July, we, I preached, Eliezer preached, and Damilari preached once last week evening. If there are questions from our preaching, you can raise your hand, they'll pass the microphone to you, you ask your question, and then we'll respond to it. We recall that the first sermon that I preached was about the Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. And the major point was that his sermon was biblical. Oh, Pastor Solomon, welcome back from, from your trip. That was the trip. Yeah. Uh, that the sermon was biblical, isn't it? The sermon was completely biblical. When they saw the phenomena, they speaking in tongues and everything, and people start asking questions. He didn't try to explain the phenomena from logic. He took them straight to the scripture. He was bold about it. He was clear and was evangelistic. Okay. Uh, and then we, we look at Joel prophecy about the last days. So I spoke about the last days. What does last days mean? Uh, the idea of outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the last days, what it means. I've explained that sufficiently. And then uh, after that, Eliezer preached from the book of John, that the Christian duty of discernment. Is that? Is it discernment? Yes. Yes, discernment is the other one. So victory over falsehood. Yes, victory over falsehood. In the morning, and then in the evening, yeah, here comes the Jiro and Adlai. Good afternoon, sir. Yeah, there are some seat, empty seats up here. You can find yourself some space. Okay, victory over falsehood. That's First John chapter 4. Okay. Uh, in the evening was the blessedness of what? Of dissatis dissatisfaction. Yes. And then the last Sunday was in the morning was the issue of mercy. If I ask compassion, what is the title? The blessedness of Christian compassion. That was in the morning. And the evening, what was the topic? Establishing the kingdom. Establishing the kingdom by uh, Brother Damilari Sobanjo. And today, we look at Jesus, his humanity, uh, and so on and so forth. Now, is there anything you do not understand that you need clarification? Any question? from your interaction with these things. If the question is to Damilare, you say, this question is to Brother Damilare, he will come up here. Maybe he should even come and be closer to... <laughs> come, Brother Damilare. I want to stay with his wife and get warm, so let him stay. Uh, so he won't feel cold. When we need him, we'll call him to come and answer for himself. Yeah. So... Uh, you can come, uh, Damila, because you are far away. You can just be in case your anybody remember your heresies last week. <laughs> Some of your heresies. Any question for me, for or for Damila, or for Eliaza? One. Let me take number. There's one up here. You. You want to ask question? Two? Mm -hmm. Three? Okay, let's start with one. Bro, uh, sister, F fire coming. Okay, this, the question is from the sermon about um, mercy, being merciful for Christians. Okay. So how... Uh, well, that, that you should come. Okay. That should be your, your monkey. Okay. So the first question, how do we balance being merciful with uh, not putting ourselves in harm's way? And um, how can we practice mercy without necessarily risking, uh, unnecessarily risking our own well-being in the process? And also, um, showing mercy to others sometimes um, how can we apply wisdom to? Because sometimes we are also aiding and abetting evil when we show mercy to some people in reality. For instance, people who fraudulently beg for arms or people who fraudulently 
ask for support where there is no need and um, all that. How, how can we be wise in uh, showing mercy without aiding and abetting uh, falsehood or fraud? And also, uh, even how many questions are you asking? It's, it's, it's the same question. It's building. It's, it's building, yes. And even sometimes, for instance, it was mentioned about maybe disaster happening in certain places, and oh, a thousand people died, 500 people are homeless, you know, and then we can take um, uh, people in and, you know, do what we can if we can. Um, and sometimes, maybe if we cannot, people go through NGOs, for instance, to help in disaster situations and also we know that some NGOs too can be uh, false, they can be fraudulent in this process so we would also be aiding their evil by giving through that process so how can we uh, do that without necessarily putting ourselves in arms way and without aiding and abetting falsehood. So the second part of the question is how can church be involved in acts of mercy um, apart from the, uh, apart from doing good to those of the household of faith because uh, we d it wasn't specifically um, for, okay, uh, do good to believers. We should be merciful in all, all around. How can church be involved in acts of mercy, even outside of um, uh, the church, and without removing the fact that um, the, the church stands to preach the gospel? How can we also show mercy to those outside uh, corporately? Now, this, this jump question, how many of you understand? Do you understand? I don't know if you understand the question. It's clear enough, right? Good. How do you show mercy without enjoying yourself or aiding and abating wrongdoing? And how can the church corporately be involved in an act of mercy? Um, yeah, so for the first question, um, I think there was a point in the sermon where we said, why don't we show mercy? And the second is, I don't know how. And the preacher that day said, do your research, ask questions, talk to the elders of the church, and you'll be shown how to show mercy. For example, if as a Christian I have a hundred thousand lying around somewhere, and I want to use that hundred thousand to do the work of mercy, and I'm scared that this person is not saying the truth. The proper thing is to ask questions. When we do our diligent research, most of the times, that will spare us from putting our money where uh, it will be useless, uh, it, it, will be, it, it will be used for. Now, the church also has a mercy ministry, right? And so when believers have, they want to show mercy, the first place for me Come to the local church and talk. If you are scared of being taken advantage of, that is, you are not sure this person is genuine, come to the local church. And I'm going to use a practical example. So, um, last month or two months ago, there's a guy that started coming here. Uh, Brother Samson knows the guy. So, one day I went out to buy something, and uh, I think I went out to buy bread at night. And as I was about to cross the road, I saw the same guy. Ah. And so, I say, guy, how far? What's happening? And he says, chairman, I have not eaten since morning. I have not done all of these things. He said he's on, he's on drugs. I say, really, you're on drugs? He said, yes. So he said, make I even show you the drugs. And so he put his hand in his pocket. I was about to remove the drugs. And I was removing the, the so-called drugs. There were cigarettes. There were other things. And immediately I knew that this kind of person his problem is not me giving him money at that point. A lot of money is not going to help him. So I just gave him enough money for him to buy water. I said, carry water, drink. Then the next Sunday, I was coming to church, and um, I was on the bike, and then I saw the same guy at Sun City Junction, just the junction that was leading to the estate. And he was trying to stop me and say, help me. And I told him, I said, come to church. If you are truly in need, come to church, when you come to church, we sit down and we will talk. So at that point, I'm not being wicked because I know that guy, what he's asking for, because I've already asked, I've talked to Bro Samson, I've talked to Bro Deji, I know all of the information, so I know how to react at that particular point in time. He says, give me money for transport, he will not use it for transport. And so wisely, I've asked questions, 
I've known about him. I've, I've even spoken to his father one day when the office when he was there. We put it, we, we placed a call across to his father. And so we know all of those situations. So knowledge would help us not to be taken advantage of. Ask questions. Talk to those who you know may, may have. And if you don't, if you are still scared, bring your money to the, the feet of the apostle. And then the apostle will, <laughs> will determine how it should be dispensed. So that's the first question. And in a way, I've answered the second question as well. So that the church has a mercy ministry. So there are other people that the church is helping that are not members of the church. I can bring some examples. I think last year we helped a woman with surgery. Right? So there are people who actually, when they have need, come to the church to ask for need. And those needs are met appropriately. So a brother called me um, two weeks ago, and he told me that he had a friend who was a sickle cell, and her leg was about to be amputated, and he did not know what to do. It's, it's actually it's, it's not in church. So I told him that, okay, the church actually can help you. But the question is, you have not even met the family of the of the person who needs help. You have not seen doctor, doctor's report. So I gave him guidelines and I said, get this, 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 this ready and talk to Pastor Abutu. Last week, I called him by way of follow-up and I asked him. And I said, have you done this, this? He said, no, Pastor Abutu told me to meet the girl's family. And then he said he's about to do that before the matter comes back to the church. So the church actually has an arm of mercy. Of course, there's always, we can always do more. But then we have to realize that the problems of the world are more than what we can handle. So mercy ministry, even though it looks small, it does not look large, it's still mercy ministry. So we help the poor, uh, we feed those who are hungry, there are many people who cross by here, they don't have anything, the church actually does that to help them. So in our own little way, the church is doing that. Now about um, big large scale disasters, if we have the capacity, of course we will respond would respond. And then another thing I just want to put by just an extra is, so if we notice that there's actually a crisis, we have the responsibility to bring that to the awareness of the church. For example, if there's a flood issue, maybe in Kabusa, we should not assume that Trinity Baptist Church knows that there's a flood issue. Bring it before the membership of the church and say, I have seen this need. Why don't we respond in this way? So those of us who are members, that's our responsibility. So instead of saying, ah, the church is not doing anything, the church is not doing anything, when you find it, the church is actually doing something you may not be aware of. But when you find a practical need, you see somebody who is homeless, jobless, in need of things, bring it before the knowledge of the church membership. And it's a congregational church. And then the church will determine how they are to reach out to those particular needs. So I hope I've, I've tried to scratch the surface here. Yeah. And that is, is quite helpful because the days are evil, isn't it? And many of us here have half our fingers burnt just because we want to be, be merciful. Uh, you cannot... It, the reason we got your hands burnt is not because of mercy. It's because of your own lack of uh, wisdom. It is wisdom deficit that caused you that pain, not mercy. Mercy ministry, mercy disposition itself is neutral. It is that it is at the point of application that's where challenge now comes strong. So you have to pray like we are not, Christians are not random people. We are managers of God's uh, resources. I have this money you have to pray about it. Say, God, give me discernment how to use this money. It's not only NGOs that are front lent. Even churches can be front lent. For instance, Brother A gives church 100,000 for mercy. He said, are there poor people in church? Are there widows? Are there orphans? I want this money to be used. If the church used that money to buy land, it's wrong. I hope you understand that. If that money now enter buying AC, buying war fan, buying war clock, sponsor pastor trip to Germany, that money is called uh, what's the name? And misappropriation of fund is not actually still. It's not. It's not. It's not the same thing as. You no, know, many of us don't see it as a bad thing. 
in law or in financial whatever is as serious as if you have stolen the the money. Is that true? Like if you, you didn't take the money, this money is for this thing. You you took it and then you you use for this. What you use it for, people can see it. But that the money was not meant for this. It was meant for this. It's called misappropriation of fund. I think people are going to jail for that. Eh? Yes, you can actually get yourself into jail. So as a church, we must be very, very frugal with how we dispense the resources at the private level and at the church level. Is the issue of wisdom. Okay. But the point, the basic point here is not, it's not at the point of apply, applying. It's the issue of disposition. It is that as individual Christian, your heart is perpetually open to show mercy. The door of your house is perpetually open. If it means that you are naked for the sake of other people, you are ready. As the church too, mercy is not a fraction of what we do. At the center of what we do as a church is mercy. Why? Believers are the group of people that have received what? Mercy. And our God is a merciful God. And those who have received mercy cannot but. Why do you think Samson is doing what he's doing in his ministry? There's a story to it, isn't it? Why do you think some people start, start functioning in a particular way because of what had happened to them? There's no way those who have received mercy will not show mercy. That disposition should be there. But what we are failing is that disposition. You are always, always thinking that somebody wants to cheat you. So there's a wall. You have, you have you've already built a wall around yourself because of your past experiences. Uh, I say once, once beaten, twice shy. No, that's not biblical. It's not in Jeremiah chapter 11, but it's anything. If they slap you, put, they will slap you again. As far as this world endures, you'll be cheated, you'll be cheated, you'll be cheated again and again and again and again and again and again. again. In fact, sometimes you are, you are being cheated without even knowing. Your wife can be cheating you with that. <laughs> Your husband can be cheating. Your spouse can be cheating each other without even knowing. I'm talking of that cheating. I'm talking of someone taking advantage of your simplicity or, what, of, or your foolishness. Uh, whichever way. We should be merciful people. We should be merciful people. There should be milk of kindness in us by way of disposition. At the point of application, wisdom is required. Before you now say this is required. And that's where vetting comes. I mean, even here, how do you know that somebody is lying to you when the need they are talking about is so urgent? They're not giving you time to, to think. That's when you need to think. Here, here, this is our church. We don't have signboard. But four lines come here like no my business. I fell once. I mean, the man came. You could see the man. It, all the signs that the man was dying was present with him. You could see sweat coming off him as if drop of blood. He said, I'm having post cancer. I have not been to the toilet for the past three days. I have not used it for past three days. I said, how do, you come, how do you even find yourself here? And it happens on a Tuesday when we have a Bible study. And she came, he came with his, do, his daughter. The daughter was helping the man to walk. He said, I have not... I said, what? He said he went to this Mayfair and they said he should drop 15K so they can relieve him of the urine that has been... I don't know, if you, you've not gone to, so, I said, why didn't he help you? He said, they said they should drop 15,000. I said, with your condition, the man will have been merciful. I said, but why are you being managed? He said, uh, what are that teaching hospital? I said, how, how do you find your way from what teaching hospital? Rich here. I said, which church are you a member of? He said, it's a member of an Anglican church. I said, okay, where's your parish? What is your church doing about this? He said, pastor, forget about that, you know, that churches are wicked these days. You know, he, he, he wanted me to talk about his church. He said, all he did now is that 15,000 so that he can go ahead and relieve him of a, his, uh, so he can at least breathe. <laughs> That's a <how I> breathe. <laughs> so, 
I let the poor man please. <laughs> and I said, okay, you go home. I said, okay, drop your account number or that of your daughter. I will see what I can do. You go home. I said, best way, go to Awada Hospital and ask the doctor there to call me. We will step in. If you have nobody, once they admit, you say he left our admission to be walking around to gather money because they charge him something. Go back there. Once you've been admitted, call me. We will send someone to Wada, and then we'll step in. He said, Pastor, I need something like now, like now, 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 now. now. <laughs> so I transferred 15,000 so that they can go. They allowed to enter. They went out. The man even came out and said, Pastor, I know you have given me money, but your prayer, I need it more. I, I also pray for the man again. <laughs> but as I was praying, my heart told me this is, this is, this is not right. I, if I, I was so sure this is not right. But prayer, uh, prayer now, I just pray and they left. So on my way home, I saw two of them laughing, going. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, real safety inside. <laughs> I said, I passed a boot to you. <laughs> Again. <laughs> but guess what? If I encounter 10 times of that issue that day, I'll do it again. Mm. I'll do it again. Because so much, I, I don't have the whole wisdom of God to know who is genuine and who is not genuine. So my disposition is to do the best I can. If the person can lie about prostate cancer, good for him, isn't it? <laughs> you come to church and say, have prostate cancer. He, he, the man doesn't know what it's called prostate cancer. Yeah, one day, one day he might get it. <laughs> and then, you see, so that is the, we should have disposition to help. Don't be so difficult. Don't be stingy. Because the opposite of message, you are so stingy. That is your problem. And then you are looking for a way of escaping being generous, okay? But uh, if you don't want to enjoy yourself, it's up to you, okay? Make sure you do, but you must show mercy by all means. You must be compassionate. Even judge, even the judges that sentence people to death sometimes are compassionate. I have so, there, there's, every time a judge sentence someone to death, that day they'll not take another case. They'll go home. They'll go home. They'll go home. Even doctors that we think are callous, Doctors cry over their, the loss of their patient. That are for a true of us. They cry. They cry. They'll be so disappointed. It's like, could I have? So they will think they're the one that killed the, the person. Mercy. Okay. But there are some unmerciful people. May God forbid you meet them. That regardless of what's happening, they are unmoved. They can step on the corpse. To go get what they want. Yes. Even some are merciful to their own spouses. This, so they say, Pastor, why are we not helping Kabusa people? He has not helped his own family member. You no, know, Kabusa people are dying. They are dying of flood. But there's flood in your own house. Your wife's hair is due. Let me not go there. Some of you will go and eat fish. Eat pepper soup and come home and say economy is bad. <laughs> said, you know, Timibu has just listed his minister. Only eight women, only eight women. I mean, oh God, see matter, see bigger matter before. You forget about Timibu and eight ministers. Let's talk about what you are doing. Yes. Some of you that are not saved here, so you, you give your girlfriend iPhone. Your mother, your mother will call you. Yeah, I know the last one I sent you 10,000 naira. Now go kill me. But, uh, you can't tell your girlfriend like that. You can't, you can't tell your girlfriend like that. You know why you can't tell her like that. To your mom. It's now, they are all witches and wizards in the village. They are devil. They are looking for your downfall. But look at the Jezebel you are sleeping with. Look at the woman and look at your mom. Compare your mom and the person you are wasting your money on top. It's, it's, that's, it's, that's act of... 
I, there was a day I, my mom called for 10K, and I, I was trying to explain to her that I gave that money, a month, I gave her 10K a month ago. My wife said, shh. My wife now said, you gave your mom 10K last month. And you're calculating, how much do you spend per day? And the coin drop. Is it drop? We should let to show mercy from our, some of, some, of us are, some of us are not even merciful to ourselves. You never mess yourself. Smokers are liable to die young. You say something like something must kill a man. <laughs> you are not merciful to yourself. You know that you are now over 40. The way you are relating frequently, things are changing. These are not demonic. Reduce touch, reduce this. No. You sit down and balance on a bar. Then say to put to Shaki. Put to this. I mean, you have one liver. Your liver has to digest all of this thing with your kidney. You. And then on top of it, Coke, Coca Cola, all kinds of things. I mean, what smart can eat at his age? If uh, the salami try it, or arrange his funeral. It's as simple as that. Be, massive, be kind to yourself for once. Be kind to yourself. Because sometimes we are so selfish that when we are dealing with ourselves, we are not thinking about our family. Your family depends on you. You should think of those who are around you that will feel bad when you die. You will look after yourself. You, you are too selfish. Your community needs you. Your country needs you. Your brother, your sister, they needs you. Look after yourself for their sake. Go to gym. Look fit for the sake of everybody and for yourself. And if you are not merciful to yourself, in fact, the Bible says if you cannot, if, if you cannot love the human being that your eyes can see, how can you claim to love God that you cannot see? There are some of us, you are hungry, money is inside your pocket. If I spend this money now, uh, I bet, give me granola and cook, that's all. Okay, eat. Eat. I love it. Look at it. Be merciful. This body was given to you by mercy. Be merciful. Show the body mercy. Rub cream. Show your body mercy. <laughs> Second question. This idea of mercy, is that, is that clear now? Be merciful. See, open your door. I have learned now. There's no part of my room that anybody cannot enter. It will pass, isn't it? Oh, it will pass. I have my privacy, but if, if worse come to worse, there's nothing in my house that cannot be given out. Is it car? Huh? I remember I came from a very rural area. The best rich man from my community was a custom officer. He's the one that owns the first black and white TV. He, lives, he used to live in Lagos. He will, they will come home once in a year. There was a day, they, they have children of our age meet. On Sunday, they were on the generator. I'm talking of way back. <laughs> and then we will follow them. And the woman will come and will drive us out. He said, village people, they are mess. If they mess on carpet, it won't go. That's the reason. He said, these, these village children, they will drive us out. We will be hanging by the window to watch black and white air. Uh, and their dog also would drive us away. They will gather their clothes and they will pour kerosene and pour light and dragging the clothes from fire. And then they will be laughing. Why don't we give it away? The man will come to church. I'm, I'm not lying. I don't know if you have forgotten. He will perfume the area where he wants to sit down. Because farmers, they smell. They are in heaven now. And all they had, they didn't take anyone, they, nothing is with them now. So be merciful. Be very, 
be mercy personified. This church is a house of mercy. It's a house of prayer. It's a house of mercy. Cry for other people's issues. Let it touch you. In Andrew's language, there's this proverb that said, Madalo yo, madalo yo. Okweno mune dabi yoti. Interpretation. He said, when you see another person's corpse, it's like a log of wood, isn't it? Oh, see, they go, see, they go. Another person's corpse is a log of wood until you reach your house. Be merciful. That's how you become like Christ. Uh, Daniela, is it Daniela? You want to ask a question? Please, by all means, ask your question. What does he mean by Christ drank the wrath of God? Who said that? Me. Just like this. Eh? Let me sit down. Daniela, what it means is that when Christ came here and became man, when he hung on the tree, the sin of all of us were laid on him because he needed to become an, a sacrifice for our sin. So God laid on him all our sin and punish our sin in him. So the just judgment and wrath of God that is due to all humanity because of their sin were poured on Christ without measure completely. So he was suffering from the hands of men on one hand and also was suffering from the hand of God. That's what it means. And that's a good question. And the analogy of drinking came from his mouth the night before he his death, he was praying. He see the entire suffering as a cup. And he asked the father, if it is your will, let this cup pass over me. Nevertheless, if it is your will for me to drink, I will drink it. So he drank that cup, metaphorical, meta, for children, metaphor. By way of example, is suffering. Okay? Is that, is that clear now? I mean, who can help the child to understand this concept more than myself? Is there any way that can explain the wrath of God in a way children can understand more than I, I have done? Yes, Brother Laba. So if I got the question right, <coughs> and the wrath of God, and there's this illustration I, I do use to, for my children at times. So, so uh, where's the child now? Can I see your face? So that you. Sorry. Good. How old are you? Come closer. Sorry. You are nine. So do you know that nine, if, for instance, you slap your younger one, you just slap your younger one who is um, four years old, mommy may just pull your ass and tell you, don't do that again. If you slap your mate, your mate might maybe slap you back and you feel the, the revenge of your mate. If you slap your mommy, what will be the response? Can you see how the young guy is building? If you now, your mommy can say maybe, oh, she's just a child. If you slap your teacher or your principal, can you imagine the anger and the discipline? Now imagine you slapping the president of Nigeria. Now talk of God. So when we sin, we are sinning against a holy God who is exceedingly beyond us. So when you try to measure the response of what you get from your younger one to your teacher, to your parents, to the pastor, you know the anger that comes, the, the punishment that comes. Now compare it to a holy God. 
you now understand how great the anger of God is for every sin. So every sin we commit is against a holy God, a just God, a God that is beyond our comprehension. And that is why his wrath is something we can't comprehend. I don't know whether I've helped you. And that wrath now, Daniela, what happened is it come. You are the one that slap a teacher and then the teacher will have I don't, I'm not, okay, you don't understand. The teacher of our, our own teacher are not like your own teacher now. <laughs> okay? Uh, the teachers of my own generation. <laughs> if he's even coming like this, you take a. <laughs> he's just coming. You can't, even meet, you can't even meet him on the same track. Yeah. Uh, but let's use your. Yeah, you slap a policeman or a soldier. And you know the consequences immediately. How it will come back to you. So in Christ, instead of imagine God is that policeman that you slap. And the, the normal response, nobody slap policeman and just go like that. The normal response is the policeman to carry a gun or to do something nasty to you. And God look at you and sure, he say you can't carry it. But you must be punished. And then you take that punishment to Brother Felix. Can you stand up, sir? And transfer what you have done here. And then punish this person on your behalf. So this person, this person is suffering what you, you have suffered. He has taken your place. It's called substitution. It's a swap. So, the punishment that God will have, if God will even attempt to punish us for our sins, we, we can't even carry it one second. But sin must be punished. He placed those things on Christ. Who can bear it because he was innocent? And then he punished them on our behalf. So the benefit of that punishment is given to you now and then God look upon you as if you have never sinned before. Wipe away the slap, you slap the policeman because of this man. I don't know if you understand a little bit of it now. That is the gospel. The gospel is God punishing Jesus on behalf of his people and giving to them what is of Christ and giving to Christ what is of them. That is how far I can explain. I mean, it's, it's simple, but many adults here don't even understand this. It's possible that you can be an adult. You don't understand the gospel. That's the gospel. The gospel. The third question, Daniel. Good evening, church. No, just not evening. It's hunger that is doing you, eh? <laughs> <laughs> it's afternoon. Clear afternoon. Good afternoon. I understand, yeah. Um, my question is about... I have two questions. One is about what you said today. You said... Um, that the de that death cannot hold the innocent, and we see in the Bible that the other two people that didn't die. Does that mean that they were innocent? That's the first one. Then the second one was is about your sermon on Peter's um, preaching on the day of Pentecost, because in the book of Mark, chapter sixteen, verse seventeen, it says, "These signs shall follow them that believe." So, according to that scripture now, what, what is the stance of our church on speaking in tongues? Is it something that, that is, is not, it doesn't exist again, or doesn't exist? And because what they are doing is wrong, what the Pentecostals are, what the Pentecostals are doing is, they are just doing their how, shabala, bala, bala. how do you know it's wrong? I don't even know. So. <laughs> That's the issue. How do you know what they are doing is wrong? On what ground, on what premise are you building that argument that what they are doing is wrong? What's your premise? Okay. Um, I would say the reason why I say that what they are doing is wrong is because um, clearly 
we see that oh they are they are speaking gibberish they are just you just like for example in um um christ embassy for example there are so many people that will speak in tongues and still go and do what they do normally now you are going in the direction of uh, senator bukachua huh? That was talking about his wife in the plenary, and the senator, senator said, "Honorable, you are you are progressing. Put yourself together again, hmm? without mentioning anybody's name, for instance. Why do you think what they are saying is gibberish, and why do you think they are wrong? There's somebody speaking tongues in church." and go away and fornicate does not even invalidate the speaking in tongues to start with. A person can preach in the morning and commit adultery in the evening. Is is here or there? Okay. So when you are how many of you are say yeah, brother, we are behind you. This question we are behind you. <laughs> So that we'll not waste our time. So I, can, I can do personal discipleship with you. Yeah. Who is who, who, who had issue? The first the issue of uh, the two persons that went to heaven. Who are they? Elijah, yeah? Elijah and Enoch. Mm -hmm. What is what is your issue with them? Die. They didn't die. Yes. Why, why didn't they die? Were they innocent? See, see. The Enoch. The Bible says God took him. Eh? And he didn't see death. So your question like, was Enoch innocent? On what premise do you think Enoch was taken? What was the what was the ground for for for, for him being taken? The Bible says Enoch walked with God, mm -hmm. and then God took him. So, so there was there was righteousness found in Enoch and he was walking with God so Enoch was just and the interpretation is this how could he have been just if he is an offspring of Adam and it's clear from the scripture that all have sinned and are falling short of the glory of God. By human generation, everyone that is of Adam's offspring is a sinner, including Enoch. It's just that he found favor in the eyes of God, and God made him righteous. It is the application of the work of Christ retroactively that he benefited from. And that he shared in the life that we all will share in one day. What Enoch experienced, that's what all of us are waiting to experience. Nothing special about it. Because we are now righteous. The righteousness that is apart from the law, the righteousness of Christ is now being imputed to us in our justification. As God is watching the Christian now, you are a saint. You are clean. You have no issue with him. And when this life is over, whether by death or by the second coming, you will see God and you will see Enoch. Basis that were sinless in and of themselves that they were taken. Do you understand that? Even Elijah. The only reason God took him was this, what happened to Enoch had happened to him. That is one level of explaining that. There are other issues I cannot talk about. The kind of prerogative of God. I mean, is that one clear enough? Any teacher I have issue with that idea of Enoch and Elijah? Who wants to be taken? <laughs> we will be taken one day. There will be rapture. And believers will be taken, isn't it? We will be taken. A new question. Came in from where? 
give him microphone. Yeah, uh, thank you, Daddy. I, you know, I. Ah. <laughs> ah. All right, Pastor. Uh, okay, all right. Yeah, I. Sorry. Um, I, I, I. When you go through New Testament, uh, there have been a prophecy. Of, okay, let me start from Old Testament concerning um uh, the person of Elijah who was to return again before uh, the final coming. Uh, before Jesus will return. And then I remembered when um, it happened, when John the Baptist was beheaded, and uh, uh, Jesus was speaking to his disciples, and they asked him to remind him of the prophecy that uh, uh, Scripture says, Elijah will return. And he said, and Scripture said, Jesus told them he had returned. And, and immediately it added, and they knew he was talking about John the Baptist. Now, uh, considering what you just said, I, can we be true to say that John, the, uh, Elijah, met death at his second coming? Okay. So let me ask you, hold the microphone. When Jesus was transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration, who was with him? Is it Elijah or John? John. On the Mount of Transfiguration... Who was with him? Elijah. Eh? Moses and Elijah. Why Elijah, not John? As Shebi, Elijah has come in John. And by that time, John has been killed. Okay. Why are you quiet now? No, uh, because, okay, it's, uh, I think you need to, because I'm trying to relate this with see, scripture, literally. The question of this guy is separate from where you are going. Okay. There are some persons that say, the Bible says it is appointed unto man to die wow. once. And if a man did not die, he has violated the scripture. Therefore, some of them have to come back to be killed to fulfill that prophecy. So Elijah came back and was killed. At least his, his own case uh, as balance. It's Enoch now. <laughs> that must come back. In fact, some person believe that the two witnesses in the book of Revelation that shall be killed and their corpse seen for three days, you know, these people like Koche used to be a heretic. You know, they are the two, uh, it's Enoch and uh, Elijah. Because the reason is Enoch and Elijah is that they have not yet seen death. I.e., therefore they will come back, then they will be killed. So the reason for their coming back is primarily just to be killed. So you can be happy that nobody has cheated anybody. <laughs> yeah. So please, there's something you must understand, what we call normative and exceptions. There are times things happen in the scripture that are exception and not the rule. You know, God can, that is the confessions, God works normatively through means, but he can work against the means and what against the means above the means he can work above the means against the means for his own glory and whatever he does with elijah and enoch were con are consistent with his glory he didn't pick them up willy-nilly there's a righteousness that he picked them up on that basis and that righteousness is the righteousness of christ because there are no two tracks to heaven there's one track to heaven and it's christ so the work of Christ was people benefited from his work looking forward. And we are benefiting from his work looking backward. All of us meet, congregate at the cross. Is that one clear now? The issue of tongues. You know why you could not really... Who want to help him? Do you know why you, you will struggle? Has anyone here in this church heard from this mouth, this holy mouth? That speaking in tongues is banned in this church. Raise your hand if you have heard that from my mouth. It's just that you have not heard me speak. Have you both spoke here before? Yeah? Have you I? Is that my wife? Okay. Have you both spoke before? Yeah. Anyway, not seriously. Uh, Two things. Mark 16. 
verse 16 to 17, these signs shall follow them that believe. Eh? Read it. Daniel, read it. So we can, we can take it apart. Mark 16, 16 to 17. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. Should I continue? Of course. They will pick up serpents. They will pick up serpents, hands. yes. And if they drink any deadly poison, they will drink poison. It will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. Yeah. Verse 19. So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord walked with them and okay. confirmed the message by accompanying service. Yeah. Daniel, with all this serious now, do you think you are a Christian? Ali, in your, look at your heart very well. Do you think you are a believer? Do you have doubts? Do you need smart to tell you you are a Christian? So ever since you were a Christian, have you picked up any serpent yet? Not yet. Have you drunk poison? Have you healed any sick person that you can, you can remember? You are not too sure? Or uh, have you... How many devils have you cast out? Do you cast out devil like normal? Like, like, no, no, sir. No, sir. Does that invalidate your being a Christian? Use the microphone. That you're not doing these things. Are you still, are you still a Christian? Yes, I'm still a Christian. Why do you think? Because they say this sign shall follow them that believe. And they are not following you. Can we conclude now that you are not a believer? No, sir. Why, why, why can't I conclude now that you are not a believer? Because I believe in Christ. I believe in the death of Christ and I believe that I'm a Christian so these signs are not following you. What happened? Well I don't know why the signs are not following <laughs> <laughs> That's what you have to go and find out why those signs are not following you. You have to know why they are not following you. And don't ask Pastor Butu to tell you <laughs> why they are not following you. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Don't make it a church matter. Because sometimes we run away from... You see, it's like, why this church know they speak in tongues? Who says you should not speak? Or why this church know they carry serpents? Bring serpents. Why are we not carrying serpents? <laughs> because you don't pick one. Because, you know, we, we, we run to easy things. Easy, eh? Anybody can speak in tongues. But let's bring a basket of serpent here now to demonstrate uh, some, some cobra here now. I guarantee you all this born again will start fighting the door. They're not saying, no, pastor, that's not, the, that's not exactly what the Bible is talking about. <laughs> yes, if I bring a basket of serpent now, I say, okay, for, friends, if you want to talk about faith now, there's a um, black mamba here who want to try in the name of Jesus. You will tell me, pastor, that's not the correct interpretation of that scripture. It is when it comes to speaking in tongues that it becomes the correct interpretation that all believers must speak in tongues. Are you, are you, are you following what I'm saying? The issue of, I don't even know why the issue of tongues is, is still a problem for some of you. When Paul wrote to the Corinthians, I think the issue were clear there. And then I don't want you to struggle with the idea of things seized, what they call what they call secessionism. I don't know things in the scripture that happens once and never happen again. Like the Red Sea happened how many times? Eh? Like they throw rod for ground, it turned to snake. How many times it happened? But don't worry, these are children, this is a children's church. <laughs> you should not let the children cry. Don't marry. <laughs> they just give you attention. There are things that God does in the Bible in, in the progress of redemptive history that were forwarding to Christ, towards Christ. And when Christ came, 
there were some promises he gave in the gospel that were specifically meant for the apostles. And the apostles did exercise that promise and then it ends with the apostles. Because we do not believe in apostolic succession. So the signs of the apostles are not expected to be with us because the apostles are no longer with us. But the deeds of the apostles as written down in the scripture are with us to that extent. This is an apostolic church. The church is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. If you don't understand things that terminated at each point in the biblical history, you will think if Elijah destroy people on Mount Carmel, I should be doing it. You would think Elijah called down fire from heaven. I should call down fire from heaven. And I, I saw one guy recently that carried buckets. Say fire should come down. People are manufacturing fire now to come down. So you should understand where things happen, for what purpose they happen, and how it terminates. So where we are today as a church, we are post-Pentecost in a way if you are expecting Pentecost to repeat itself, you are looking for many, many things must be answered. Like we must be in Jerusalem on a Pentecostal day. The, the physical uh, fire glows, must sit on your head. Have you seen one? Ever since you became a Christian, you have been to various churches where all of us are speaking to us. Have you seen clothing tongues as fire sitting on anybody's head? So we take the cheap one. The one we cannot manufacture we we'll just push it away as if, why has that ceased? Why has the clothing tongue ceased and the tongue has not ceased? So these are the issues you must go home and rest two ways. But the issue of tongues is, is straightforward in the Bible. Paul wrote to the church by the Holy Spirit, inspired apostle, and said, when you come together, for you have come together for the purpose of edification. So what am I hearing? That you are on Sunday, come together, all of you are babbling, you are speaking like tongues. He said, if an unbeliever comes to your midst, what benefit? And this instruction was given when the New Testament has not yet been written and collated. So when the church gather before the canon of scripture was uh, completed, you need a, 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 by way of prophecy, people that a a language that were not known to people come through like a phenomena. And Paul said, if that happened among you, let it be one, two, or three. Let them speak one after the other. And let interpretation also be, for instance, but then you come to this church now, tongue, don't you, but tongues has come on you. And it's boiling your tummy. You raise your hand. The pastor in church that they will say, okay, you have tongue or sass have tongue and smart, they have, three of you have tongue. Let it be done one after the other. And then that will come in, to this front. And I say, we'll be listening. <laughs> Don't say we should say it after you. Who all of us will be listening? And then after you do your and then you now say, Interpretation. Either you now interpret or, or SARS now start helping you to interpret. It never ends there. The Bible says when you are done with the tongues and interpretation, the whole church will do what? Will judge it and weigh it, the balance of scripture, before we can even think that thing is from God. And guess what? If that thing you are saying now is already in the scripture, it was never necessary. And if it's not in the scripture, trust me, it's false. That is the issue that we are battling with now. And after Paul, Paul that issue of speaking to us was not an issue with Ephesus, but with Galatians. It is current. Because that is, that is, it was, it's never an issue. He that speaks in tongues must interpret. Now, the new thing that you guys are talking about is the idea of prayer language. Even the Mark 16 say they shall speak. Now they shall pray with new tongues. Because God understands every language. 
So most Pentecostals will tell you, no, we are not even talking about that current thing. We are talking about he that speaks in tongues edify himself. So I'm edifying myself. But the argument of Paul is that when we are gathered on a Sunday morning like this, it is not for individual edification. It was for mutual edification. So go home and speak to God by yourself and leave the church alone. So when we come together, we use words that are intelligible, that are decipherable, so that everybody will understand and be edified. So the issue of prayer language is another matter for another day. Yeah. So by all means, by all means, to the extent that you understand Christianism, if anybody is in this church now that tongues, are, tongues is bad to you, come, come forward. We will listen. We will not listen. I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps we will listen. We will finish. You know what I've heard over the times? There are some, like Foursquare, for instance. Foursquare used to be against this gibberish, like prayer language. But if I in a, a normal, I'm talking of first square before now, in the first square church, and the pastor is preaching, she started to look and just fell under the anointing. Ah! They say, okay, shh, he has come, he has come, he has come. Shh, both the pastor and the preacher will just quiet. And then she'll be rolling, this chair will be rolling. And then, and then, speak, okay, you see that. <laughs> speak, Lord. And then the same sister told her, say, Oh, my daughter, why are you wearing attachment? You are hurting my soul. I'm coming back very soon. And then, like, so like someone else said, I saw the Lord with trumpet in his hand. The angel wants to blow the trumpet right now, but the church is not ready. The church is not ready. The church is not ready. Oh, my children, give me your heart. I love you. I die for you. Give me your heart. Give me your heart. <sighs> of course, she's tired. <laughs> and then they, they will now say, Thus says the Lord. You have been duped. A pastor is preaching. That is God speaking. The word of God is talking to you. And then the word of God is speaking. And God also break, start talking again. God does not work like that. God is not the author. For instance, Bwari, not Bwari. Tunibu is giving speech. Half a left Bwari. So, well, well. <laughs> Can you imagine Tunibu is giving his speech? And then the spokesperson, Alak, now stand up again and start giving another speech on behalf of the president. Does it work like that? No, no. If Alak is speaking, it means Tunibu is not a... He's not there. It's one or the two. When we come to church, we have come under the word of God. From singing to praying to preaching for everything is under the auspices of the word of God. And when the Bible speaks, God speaks. The Bible is... A, where is Daniel? Okay, sit down. When the Bible speaks, God speaks. Okay? The Bible is the word of prophecy. For the Bible is, is speaking in tongues personified and it's in your language so you can understand that's how i want to approach that question okay yeah but here we, pr we pray in the language that all of us can appreciate and say amen if i pull even the that so why do you even pray the language how can you say amen to what they don't uh, yes it's the bible somebody will not just stand up and pray in a different tongue and then you are saying amen maybe it's even insulting your 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 father, and then you are saying amen. It is you that had problem, not the person. And not the scripture to start with. Finally, Mark 16, if you have your Bible, most of the translation will give you from that verse 17 or 16. There's a textual var variant there, you should understand. That the older, the older manuscript do not have that version in certain to it. And that is a different matter for another day. Okay. Question? Yes. Okay. Last one before we go. How much? <laughs> See, some of you are going to eat meat pie from City Mart. I saw you. <laughs> yeah? Okay, but Deji, are you sleeping? Wake him up. We are praying. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, my question is um, directed to Brother Milari. The last Sunday evening service, his text was from First Kings chapter two. So his text was from First Kings. Questions for Damilare, Brother Damilare. Chap yeah, chapter two. So I think he used that um, story of when Solomon became king. He used that as an anal analogy of the Christian life, yeah. and he points about and uh, he pointed to instructions given to Christians that they should follow. So, and if I should paraphrase him, he talked about um, a dis um, Christian being disobedient brings about um, them being swept in judgment. So, I want to know, that what was the meaning of that swept in judgment? Is it by way of punishment for Christians or eternal damnation? So, just throw my light on that. Or are you actually speaking to non-Christians? So. Do you get it? Where Osas is coming from is that Christians have passed from judgment, isn't it? To life. So being swept away that I was mentioned last week, is it for Christian or non-Christian? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Um, Christians have passed from death to life if they are Christians. Um, so the... There's a short way and a medium way to answer the question. So the, the, there's a way that the, that the Bible approaches the question of salvation. And I think it was Brother Eliezer in one of his uh, First John series. I think it was First John 2. Um, yes, First John 2, where um, John was saying that they've come out of us, uh, or they've gone out of us, something like that, but they were not of us because if they've been of us, they will not have remained with us. So there's a way that the Bible talks about those kinds of people, and those kinds of people are also in, the, in this large assembly. So when, when uh, for instance, when John was talking, I suppose that they had people like that, that all of us were sitting down here. We are talking, you know, everybody here is probably baptized also. And then they, we all confess Jesus all the time. We all sing good songs. And then maybe after some couple of years, you, you see them, they are now heretics. They are now denying the same Lord. Or you know, they are living lives that are clearly anti-Christian. And so people start, started to wonder what the problem was. And so John just told them that when you see people like that, don't worry, they were never of us. Now, that is where it's coming from. <laughs> what the the thing that is undergirding what John is saying is that life of obedience. And um, when he got to chapter three, uh, I'm talking about his sermon. In fact, I'm I'm leaning on his sermon. When he got to chapter three, and he got to that part of John where John now said that he that is born of God does not sin. He cleared it up by saying that he's not saying that the person doesn't will never sin, but that. The person does not have an unbroken pattern of sin. That is, he doesn't live in disobedience. So, so that's the key word. There is a way that the Bible expects us to walk in obedience, even though once in a while you fall into disobedience. And that there are some kinds of people, they live in an unbroken pattern of disobedience. Those kinds of people, even though they are with us now, even though they've been baptized, even though they've signed the roster, and they are members, even though you know they all lift up hands, even though it's not holy. God, God knows them because it was Titus that said, it was Paul in Titus that said that when the grace of God appeared, it teaches us something. It teaches us to deny ungodliness. So there, there is a way that, um, and, and, and I think that. that that's how Jesus ended the Sermon on the Mount. I know I'm going around, but it's, it's because this question has always you know, come around all the time. The way Jesus ends the Sermon on the Mount, he, he ends, even though the Sermon began by saying that it was his disciples that came to him. And yet, Jesus now ends the Sermon by saying that there's actually two kinds of gates. And behind those gates, he talked about it this morning, there are roads. One gate is wide, so the road that is behind that gate is wide. 
and there are many people that find it. And I was talking to the people that have been called out to him on the mountain as disciples. And I said, but there's a second gate. It is narrow, and so therefore the road behind it, or the road you know, that it leads to is also narrow. And so he ends that, that long sermon by saying that, so therefore, if you are here, and you hear the things I'm saying, but you are not doing it, you are the one that is fooling yourself. Because again, God can't be fooled. It's not like God fell for you once. We are the ones falling for you. God can't be mocked. God is seeing what you are doing. You are not doing God's word, but you are claiming that you are part of his disciples. And so Jesus said that, so at the end of the day, judgment will come, and guess what you are going to be telling Jesus? You will not tell him that there was ever a life of obedience. Instead, you are going to lay claims to all of the church services you attended, all of the works you did, right? Because it's right there. He said, they'll come to him with some sort of familiarity. They'll tell him, oh, Lord, Lord, we, we did... I mean, Lord, Lord means, why do they call him Lord? So there's a familiarity they have with him. That familiarity is not because of an inward familiarity with him. They've never been regenerated. So that familiarity of Lord, Lord is this communal way all of us come and we say, Lord, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord. So they too have said that Jesus is Lord. They recite the Apostles' Creed with us every morning, Sunday morning. You know, they sing all the lovely songs with us. And so that's the thing that they can only say to Jesus when they see him. Now, oh, see, 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 see all the things we did. The day they called evangelism, I was there. Oh. And they recited all these things. And Jesus was like, no, you walked iniquity. That is, you had an unbroken pattern of iniquity. And so, therefore, get away from me. And then there were these other kinds of people that Jesus said that, you see, so these ones are not workers of iniquity. And so they are the ones that will be welcomed into his eternal kingdom. So if, and it's the reason when you read Hebrews, for instance, the writer of Hebrews, I think, interjected his exposition about three or four times to warn them over and over again because there truly is a possibility that you'll be hearing these things. And, and it's the reason the writer of Hebrews, I think, in chapter 3, and uh, like three or four times you read Hebrews, he, he paused to warn them because there, there truly is a possibility that sin has hardened your heart. But, but because you, know, you are here, you know, there's communal holiness. I mean, on Sundays, there's a way that pastor is holy, so vicariously you are holy. You know, that, that idea, or uh, Braileza is holy, so you too, you are holy. I mean, ah. Trinity Baptist Church is the holy church, so I'm part of that church, so therefore, vicariously, we are holy. But the writer of Hebrews pauses many times, and the Bible really pauses a lot of time. Paul did it many times, and kept telling them that you need to do the check. Has there truly ever been a point in your life where you've been regenerated, where your desires have changed, where you hate sin? Or, is, I mean, check yourself. And that is the point of it. Christians would not be swept away in judgment. And that's the good thing. We have come to believe truly in Jesus. We have, we have come to put everything on him. And that's what Pastor was saying this, this, this uh, morning. I, I don't have any other place I can turn to. I have, is the, is the basket. All my eggs are in there. I, I, uh, and, and that's the thing. Again, there's a possibility that you are saying it with your mouth. Because it's possible that you say Jesus is Lord with your mouth, but your heart is far from him. So, and I think that is, that, that is still where the, the Bible points us to, that the best way to, to evaluate yourself is, yes, you have confessed Jesus is Lord, but that powerful work, that Holy Spirit, is he producing holy work in your life? Is there holiness that is following your life? Is, are you still struggling with holiness and obedience? Is it, is it, I mean, do you feel like powerless against sin? These are better indicators of the work of the Holy Spirit in your life than of the words you said. Uh, it's, it's elaborate enough. Um, it, is, it is for us as church, as Christians, to look at this scripture and admonish. The reason why David was telling Solomon was because Solomon is now a king. The admonition to put to death sin is for, is for Christians and not is for professed Christians and not everybody. Yeah, because if you're not a Christian, you are not be given the life of God.
to hate sin and to fight sin. Yeah. Is that it? Sorry, we, have, we are out of time, but let me just take you, uh, Brother Solomon. Okay, you drove out, you came all the way today, yeah. So I want to just, I mean, um, it's to you, Pastor, your first sermon. Okay. On Can I still remember? <laughs> on um, ask Peter's Pentecost uh, sermon. And it's the verse 17. I think it was quite clear mm-hmm. how you helped us understand the interpretation of the Jewish prophecy. But I'm just, I just wanted to ask, how do we understand the, various, the other categories just for the purpose of being able to address questions uh, probably from, from other Christians who may ask? For instance, um, and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream, dream dreams. The categorization of the prophecy as to speaking the word of God was very clear. Mm-hmm. But it, these other categories, how do we understand them today? <clears throat> that your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Let me ask the issue of dreams. How many of you can raise your hand and say you are young? They say you are not young. <laughs> Even Sister Tolle is young. Do you, do you have dreams? Do you dream dreams? Do you dream dreams? Eh? But the Bible says old men here shall dream dreams. So what happened to your own dreams? Hmm? See the issue now. Okay? So we should be careful. I understand the categorization we're talking about. I think the idea of prophecy there actually is uh, you you actually saying the same thing. Uh, in the redemptive history, God uses some things to speak to the church or to the fullness of time when Christ came and then we have the canon of scripture, Hebrews 1. God spoke to us in diverse weeks, time past, but in the last day he has spoken through his son. So, yes, it's possible, because we are human, let me say this with much carefulness, it's possible to have dream about some... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. For question. Contextual Yeah. When you mentioned the last day, when you mentioned Hebrew, yeah. And the last day that God has, I mean, spoken, yes. spoken to us through His Son, mm-hmm. and Joel was prophesying and saying in the last day as well, and gave these categorizations. Mm-hmm. I don't even understand. Like what sure. people will be doing, like individuals will be doing, or what? So how do I explain this text? This two sentences um, yeah the one because they all still spoke about in the last days yeah the hebrew one spoke about these days which is the last day mm-hmm. god has spoken to us through his son yeah i think it's it's clear to me right i'm just saying excuse me ask that question to say okay today how do i how do i understand this text this Jewish prophecy your young men shall see visions your old men shall dream dreams okay so is this speak, is this two other categories speaking to the same thing? Or do we just I mean to be aside? Let me just get the question properly. Are you saying that we expect since we are in the last days, our young men should be functioning in dreams? Is that what you are trying to say? Is that the question? So the question is how do I explain this to someone who believes that? I think you can explain it to that person in the light of Hebrews 1. Uh, yes, Andrew, what is it? I think the same thing you were saying. Yeah. The prophesied there is like all encompassing, both the dreams and the visions. My translation here says, verse 29, it says, Even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. So he's explaining what he said in verse. 28, that even on these people I will pour out my spirit. And like Pastor said, God has used both dreams, visions. Peter had a vision in, yes. in Acts and yes. then. And you see, even Joseph and Mary, you see how dreams were functioning there. And that's, that's what before they. Uh, 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 that. So, but we, we live in an era where we have the, the sure word of God in our hands, where 
dream is no longer my primary good to when I'm seeking the will of God. Dream is not uh, primary when I'm looking for the leading of God or, or visions. What we are having here is vision downloaded, dreams downloaded for us. And God uses the apostles and the apostles' companions to bring the New Testament to bear, I think we, it's sufficient. Yeah, we want to answer. I think there is a part of the question we, we are not really getting. We. If I, if I, if I get Speak for yourself, yeah. to myself now, he said, he quoted Hebrews 1. Long ago, many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophet. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. In these last days. Now, he's now comparing last days as used in Hebrews mm -hmm. to the last days as quoted by Prophet Joel. Mm -hmm. He said, how can we reconcile? Are the two last days saying the same thing? Ask your own question. <laughs> no, that's the same thing. That's what he's saying. That leaves the context. Okay. That leaves the context. Yes. Last days. And I'm asking, like I said, I understand. What you, I mean, I, I, I was just asking myself, how do I... Yeah, walk why, around why do you have issue with the last days? I don't no, I, I, how do I walk around this if someone does ask that kind of question? Yeah. That was just my question, basically. I, I think they are saying whether the two last days are two different things. As to whether the spirit is on male and female, we all can understand the gospel. There yeah. is no barrier. Yeah. When it comes to this, it just prophecy was prophesying yeah. dreams and visions yeah. in the last day. These two other two, when you were preaching, it seems as if there was a glossing over it. Isn't, I, think I wasn't clear. And because I took it for granted that the prophecy was like an overarching idea. Exactly. That was that, that's what I took it for granted. And again, the last day in Jewel, you know, the Old Testament, our time is gone. Old Testament prophecy does have like two, like a dual role. There are part of it that have the immediate effect. So the last day in Jewel could mean towards the end of their captivity. When God is lifting the siege, the trouble he placed them in, things that will be happening. So the prophecy is for the Jews, for where they are, but does have a larger, a redemptive interpretation for us and for Christ. So it's like this, it's like you're on one mountain and there's a higher mountain. That's how it happens in the Old Testament. Like even the virgin conception and everything, every prophecy in the Old Testament have like immediate immediate something but have a a far a futuristic uh, implications yeah but the last day in hebrews is quite clearer Christ, god has spoken and has spoken through his son and that is sufficient yeah but when we start categorizing things i don't think joel is even it's not even the issue of category it's okay young men in this church your role is to see visions old men in this church dream so when we come on Sunday let's week okay old men where are your dreams? Young man, where are your visions? That's not how it goes. It don't work like that. God has spoken to us in his word and we are hearing him daily. I think we, we are hungry and we need to go home. So next month, I will try to talk to the leadership to make sure maybe what those who bake can bring meat pie for sale. At least, can we, can we do people for the Naira? That would be too difficult. It would be difficult to have it's possible. Maybe at 500 naira meat pie, so you can just buy it with Coke, and then we see how we can support each other, so we, we can have a, a longer stay power. Okay. I can see hunger in your, in your face. Okay. But thank you so much for this our maiden edition. The rest of the question, please can you text them to me, and then we continue to respond to them, or you can bring it back next month when we gather by the grace of God. But it is good we understand the scripture and understand it properly. But much more than that, that is being applied in our daily lives. There is nothing called a Christian who is not fighting sin. There's nothing. It's, 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 it does not exist. And the issue with us now, according to the last week I heard, was that it's not the issue of knowledge. There's nobody here that doesn't know sin is bad. It's not the issue of ability. In the issue of desires. So work on your desires. Work on your desires. What you hate, you hate. And what you love, you love. Work on your desires. And prioritize your work with God over and above everything. <coughs> Even your own life. It is good for you.
Okay. And because you no know we are doing this thing now is that this the next attack is this and it's been attacked daily now in this country. People are sitting aside scripture and we should be very, very clear from this church that we stand on the scripture. And we must know how to interpret it, how to explain it, how to understand it. And if there are questions, bring it to the church. Don't run away with your own private interpretation and say, this is what my Bible is telling me. There's not like my Bible. It's, it's our Bible. It's given to the community of believers. You can't have a private interpretation working for you somewhere and it's not working for other people. That is wrong. So that is, uh, we stop here today and uh, thank you for Eliaza, thank you for Damirare and uh, this month of August will be other preaching and preachers. You do well to come with your notes and write down your uh, questions and whatever you want to take home with and then that will be a good way of growth. Your uh, is Tolu, I learned she remove uh, a tooth. She's fine. We give our love to her. Bro Brown is having some malaria typhoid. Please reach out to Brown and uh, let him feel that you are praying for him. And uh, reach out to Wilson and his wife. They are not here today. And the rest of our members who have traveled and some who are busy at work today. This is the size of our meeting today. Uh, I want to dismiss the church now. If there's no any other person information or question or whatever, let's dismiss ourselves and be on our way home. Finally, I'm learning now that part of our, our Christian life is fellowship does not mean we come and go, in that we come together as a church, as, as people of God, and talk to one another and really fellowship and really know what is going on in our lives. So try your best next time when you're in church to get to know people, know their names, know where they are staying, know where they are coming from, and be in their lives. It's a functional fellowship. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you so much for the endurance you're giving to your people to wait, to wait on you, to wait on your word, and to reason through that which you've been teaching us as a community. Bless us now, we pray, and cause that your word take root in our lives, and our lives are sharpened by it. Bless the rest of the week. Things are hard. Times are hard economically. Open doors for your people and pro prosper the works of their hands. Open doors for your people and grant that they may uh, find the fruit of their labors and give us wisdom how to manage our little finances, uh, how to go around these hard times. Be with our president. Give him wisdom that they may act responsibly and responsively to the suffering of the people. Lord, may your kingdom come and your will be done. In Jesus' name we pray.